Well, good evening and uh, welcome to the state of our nation. My name is uh, Vuyom Vogo. Well, Stone Sizani is the chief whip of the ANC, the majority party in parliament. I spoke to him earlier and asked him what his party's priorities were and whether his party was bothered at all by the EFF's criticisms of the ANC members' performance in parliament and what he made of not only the EFF but also other parties' criticisms of uh, them. Uh, the EFF, as everyone would know by now, has threatened to, dis, um, to uh, disrupt President Jacob Zuma's speech um, on Thursday. I asked Mr. Sizani about that and more. Here's how our conversation went. Mr. Sizani, thanks very much um, for talking to us. But first of all, your party, is it ready for 2015? Yeah, we are all systems go for, uh, for Thursday. As a political party, and you uh, are being the driver of uh, your party's parliamentary work, what for you are the most urgent priorities? Well, uh, based on the January 8th statement of the NEC, as read by the president in Cape Town in January, uh, we expect the president to, to focus on the Freedom Charter, both the progress that we have achieved up to now and the way forward, based on the programs that government uh, has to drive, like infrastructure, prioritizing education, making sure that uh, the national health insurance is uh, broadened beyond just the provinces where it has started, and the 27 poorest uh, districts of our country given the necessary infrastructure. We think that the president is going to focus on the improvement both of the economy and the poorest of the communities living in South Africa. Well, if, we, if, I, if I pick up on um, uh, two issues uh, from uh, just what you said now, infrastructure, um, if one looks at the reviews, what um, um, those who have opinions on this matter have said um, over the past weekend, um, your party is, the ruling party is not doing particularly well on infrastructure. And if one takes into account or looks at what is happening in Malamulele, um, the poor are not happy or certainly sections of them. Well, um, let's start with the infrastructure. I've read the reviews that uh, many people have been commenting on. Ironically, the majority of the information uh, is said to come from the ANC itself. And uh, the frankness with which we provide information to South Africans is, for me, very encouraging because we hide nothing and we confront the reality that South Africans are facing, and we're making sure that uh, we have a plan to correct all those weaknesses. And whoever formulates an opinion is formulating an opinion on what we have said, what we have tabled, what we have revealed to South Africans. Uh, for the poor people, we're working hard to make sure that the ANC's mandate by the electorate from May onwards is going to respond to the needs of the poor, providing electricity, providing water, providing houses, making sure that the roads are passable in the rural areas, agriculture is thriving. And uh, in my view, uh, we are working very hard to make sure that South Africans are happy. Just this weekend, I was in the Lekhutla of the province of the Eastern Cape, Minister Nguindi and Minister Zokwana have made a commitment to spread the rural development across the countryside, not only in the Eastern Cape, across the country. I think that there is a commitment to improve the conditions of people. I think that uh, the officials that are working with them are committed to make sure that this reality is made, uh, is realized sooner than later. Well, uh, acknowledging, of course, um, I mean, the problem is, is, is one thing, uh, but doing something about it is another. 
a constant criticism of your party is that one, um, it does have or has driven a lot of good, poli put um, a lot of policies, good policies in place, but always falls short um, when it comes to implementation. Uh, then again, there's that phrase, um, a lot has been done, but a, but a lot more still needs to be done. And that, um, some of your critics say, sort of puts you in a bit of a comfort zone, a self-created one at that, um, which then allows you to say, we are aware, and the information you are using comes from us, but beyond that point, you're not really driving things um, uh, as, quite, as forcefully and as hard as you perhaps should. I, I disagree with the uh, opinion makers. First of all, we provide the information. We also say that we, we are falling short of our own targets, and then we commit to provide solutions to those problems. I just said now that uh, two ministers who were present in the Lekhutla, where I come from, have specifically said, here are the plans, here are the resources, this is what we are going to do. And uh, whoever is criticizing us must criticize us of neglect rather than lack of trying, because we work hard to meet our targets. Now, um, it is your responsibility to make sure that um, your cadres deployed in parliament do their work and do it well. Are you happy? Are you satisfied with, your, with the performance of your MPs in parliament, in committees specifically? Nobody can ever be happy 100% of the work that we all do, including my work. But what is important for us is that all of us, we put our shoulder to the wheel and we push as hard as we can to ask the executive to account to the people of South Africa through, through parliament and using the committees to explain where the shortcomings are, where the flaws are, and where the policy is successful, where the policy is weak, so that it can be improved. And I think that we are pushing very hard to achieve that. Well, if one believes what um, the opposition parties um, are saying about the performance of your MPs, um, it is that um, they say um, all that they seem to be doing these days is to protect um, their leadership, to protect ministers, to protect the president. Your comment on that? Well, our responsibility in parliament is to do the work of parliament, to make sure that we go out to the communities uh, like we, we are currently doing, visiting schools and other communities, to make sure that whatever government should be doing is actually visible. And if it is not, we come back and report to Parliament that uh, these uh, uh, promises that were made are not being fulfilled or are exceeded in terms of the hard work that government is doing. The opposition is led by us. They are driven by us. We decide where we go, we go, they follow us. And uh, when, when they are with us, they confirm the things we see together. When they come back to parliament, they change. And ex of course, please their leaders, because they cannot uh, express happiness with what they have seen. I have challenged uh, Honorable Malema in particular, and I said to journalists that have spoken to him, he must do one honorable thing, just to say to South Africans, there is progress that we have made as the African National Congress in government. And if he is able to be honest to himself, he even show, should use himself as an example of progress we have made from where he come from to where he is now. And uh, many communities have acknowledged that. But when they come to parliament, they play to the gallery and they grab headlines by trying to show that uh, what we are doing is not what the people are experiencing. Well, very briefly, Mr. Sen, we have run out of time. Speaking of which, um, it looks like certainly from the promise that they are making, they will grab headlines again on Thursday. Um, they intend disrupting the president's um, State of the Nation address um, to ask him to pay back the money. Your party's view on that? Well, <laughs> Honorable Malema's party is falling apart already. 
they are at each other's throat already. In desperation, he will hang on to any leaf or branch that he can, or root that he can hang on to. He's, he knows he's being a, a rude. He knows he's being disrespectful. He knows that he's jumping the gun. This process is, is being handled by Parliament. He knows there's a report in front of Parliament that specifically demands from the security establishment to quantify what the public protector says the president must pay. And, and even before there's any single invoice on the table indicating what the liability of the president is, he says, when are you going to pay back the money? Is that reasonable? He must just say one reasonable thing and see whether he can grab the headlines, because the headlines don't favor nice things. The headlines want nasty, dramatic things, and he's trying to hang on to that. Mr. Suzanne, thank you very much for your time and all the best this week and indeed the rest of thank 2015. Thank you, Vuyo. Thank you very much. Well, ANC um, Chief Whip Stone Cizani um, sharing his views with us. Well, after the break, we're speaking to the Chief Whips of the biggest opposition parties, the DA and the EFF, that's after this short end break. years now South Africa has just been one big construction site building houses. This is the only country in the world that provides free housing. The government has done very well in this particular area. What are the challenges facing human settlements? Most of the people who move into urban centers are looking for jobs basically and that increases the pressure uh, in that particular era. We know exactly what needs to be done where and how it should be done. They were also building houses for married staff and you had the married quarters and the hostels and all of that stopped. What happened? Nothing has stopped Mr. Martins. We cannot solve the housing problems on our own in this country. We cannot wait for government as well. It's a joint venture, if I were to put it like that, between the public sector and, and the private sector, particularly in the area of mines. That's Rights and Recourse, Sundays 2 p.m. on SABC News. Welcome back, and if you've just joined us, you're watching the state of our nation. We are looking at um, several issues that are topmost in the minds of South Africans ahead of uh, Thursday's State of the Nation address expected um, to be delivered by President Jacob Zuma in Parliament in uh, Cape Town. And tonight I'm speaking to the whips of the three leading parties, the ANC, um, which is the interview we just played. And up next, I'm speaking to, it, I'm playing you interviews of our opposition party chief whips that we spoke to earlier today, who are very unhappy with the way the governing party is treating them in parliament, but seem to differ fundamentally on how to deal with their unhappiness. Earlier, I spoke, as I said, to the chief whips of the DA, and the EFF, and here's how our conversation went. Gentlemen, thanks to both of you for joining us this evening. If I may start um, with um, you, Mr. Stian Hazen, in, uh, in Parliament. Your party's priorities for 2015? 
Well, obviously, what we're looking for to see from the president is how he's going to respond to the number of crises that face this nation. We're in the midst of the worst energy crisis we've seen in a long time. We want to understand how the president's going to address this matter and how he's going to tell us jobs are going to be created in this matter to deal with the spiraling unemployment in this country. And then also, we'd like to very much hear from the president what concrete steps are going to be made to deal with the matters that matter most to ordinary South Africans. Africans, their living conditions, access to water and sanitation, and housing. These are the important matters uh, that affect the state of the nation, and we're particularly anxious to hear how he's going to deal with these, these matters. Okay. Mr. Schwambo, from where your party sits, what for you are the priorities that which um, uh, the president um, should, uh, the issues that the president should emphasize on? No, look, uh, the EFF wants to hold the executive and the president himself accountable. He must be accountable for some of the uh, benefits that he got on the building of Nkandla uh, private residence uh, because the public protector, the SIU and all other reports have pointed to the fact that he unduly benefited. But also we want government to come out with a concrete program on how to deal with the phenomenon of transfer pricing, of base erosion, and profit shifting. Because the recent uh, past global financial uh, 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 integrity report pointed to the fact that in the past 10 years, 122 billion US dollars, that is like more than trillion rands, has been stolen from South Africa through transfer pricing. And government seems to have no concrete and cogent legislation and mechanism to deal with those issues. But another issue which is a crisis level is the issue on higher education which we had said uh, must be attended to. We have got more than a million children who are eligible to have access to higher education, post-secondary training in South Africa, but the Department of Higher Education has recently illustrated that only about 400,000 spaces are available at first year level. What do you expect the remaining 600,000 to do? Where should they go? Because uh, the state should have the necessary capacity to provide uh, training, education, and skills to the youth of uh, South Africa. The, the, even the amount of money which has been allocated, by the way, to NSFAS is not adequate to take care of uh, academically deserving uh, yet needy uh, uh, students uh, because the current government and uh, the officials are directing all these resources for self-enrichment and, uh, and, 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 and packs for the ministers and a variety of other unnecessary expenditures which are not necessary. So it's, it's, a, it's a broad package of issues that uh, we're going to deal with. But also we're going to put uh, legislation, we're going to put private members' bills on the introduction of proper minimum wages in all the sectors, in mining 12,500 for domestic workers, for petrol attendants, and for a variety of uh, other sectors. And, 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 uh, and they were going to, to put legislation as well in terms of banning of labor brokers. There have been commitments by almost all political parties that there must be something done on the fact of labor brokers, but no one seems to be taking real action about that. So we're going to be drafting legislation as the EFF and then say to Parliament that let us debate this draft legislation so that we're able to, to take it forward. So those are some of the things that are looking into, but all of these things must happen in an accountable system where the executive is held accountable with individual ministers, the president himself is held accountable, uh, obviously through the, the, the demand that we're making that you should pay back the money as directed by the remedial action of the public protector. Okay, let's, uh, let's then um, um, speak to, uh, I mean, some of the issues that both of you have raised, starting with you perhaps, uh, Mr. Shwambu, around um, higher education. Yes. If one listened to what um, the president of the ANC had to say on their January 8th, um, um, statement, it is that every time they're trying to bring more money into the system, every time they're trying to make sure that it covers as many people as possible, the universities hike the fees. No, look, yeah, I think the crisis of higher education in South Africa is far much more complex and deeper than uh, what the, the president observed. The crisis is the fact that you do not have adequate quantitative capacity of higher education in South Africa to absorb the entirety of those who graduate from the secondary schooling system. Why? It's because for the past 20 years, the only two institutions, public institutions of higher learning that were built 
by the government at the universities of Northern Cape and Mpumalanga, which can only take about like 300 students. And you must remember that the population in South Africa has grown uh, <laughs> between 1994 and now by more than 10 million people. Where do people go and study? Where do people go and further their studies and gain more skills and knowledge to contribute to their development, but to the development of the urban economy and society as, well, as, a, as a whole? So, so the, the crisis is far much deeper than the issue of uh, increase of, uh, of, of, of fees. Yes, there must be provision of free quality education for all students who are academically deserving, but there must be quantitative expansion of the post-secondary training and education uh, space because there has not been anyone who paid far much deeper attention to that despite the fact that we have got lots of a, a children and students who want to have access to higher education and training uh, space. Okay. Mr. Sena, is in coming to a point that um, um, you raised the energy crisis. Uh, you've heard what uh, the president has said, that it is uh, completely unfair for anyone to blame the current government because this um, is a problem that dates back to apartheid days. Well, again, it's a usual presidential doublespeak that we're hearing, and Jacob Zuma once again trying to get out of being held accountable for things which his government should have been doing. We know very well that the uh, African National Congress government received ample warning about the impending electricity and energy crisis in South Africa. Instead of taking proactive steps, they've sat on their hands for all these years. The result now is that we have uh, this energy crisis which we're sitting in, and it's affecting growth. It's it's affecting jobs and it's virtually impossible for us to plan for economic growth without energy. For us to even sustain the current levels that we have is going to be incredibly difficult, never mind introducing new growth. So what we need to see is President Zuma to stop passing the buck onto a host of other people and start stepping up to the plate and taking responsibility for the failings of his government and set before the nation a clear and comprehensive plan about how they're going to restructure ESCOM and how they're going to ensure that South Africa has a way out of this crisis. It's if not simply good enough to sit in a corner pointing fingers and blaming apartheid and blaming a whole host of other things. A lot of, uh, a lot of what could have been fixed could have happened on the watch of the African National Congress. They've chosen not to act. They've chosen to ignore it. And now we're sitting with the crisis. If you had an opportunity to write a few paragraphs on energy into uh, that speech you will be making on Thursday, what uh, would you say? Who would you be holding uh, responsible for the crisis we are in? And uh, how do we get out? Well, obviously, the first part about dealing with the problem is accepting that there is a problem. And so it's not good enough for you know, Minister Lynn Brown and the president to go around the, the country with a business as usual crisis, what crisis approach. We must accept we're sitting in a crisis. And then the president needs to start unpacking some concrete steps. He needs to show how we're going to restructure ESCOM paying back the bonuses, ensuring that the executive pay at Eskom is aligned with performance, ensuring that there is a, a speeding up of the uh, new bills to ensure that they're able to meet, uh, with meet the demands and ensure that we're able to uh, stabilize electricity supply in the country. But thereafter, we also need to look at how we manage our energy mix in South Africa. We need to look at alternative energy sources. We need to start looking at areas like gas as well, in terms of how we're able to improve the mix so that we reduce the over-reliance on coal as well. Thank you very much, Mr. Schwambu. Top um, of your list is accountability, in yes. particular, executive accountability. Yes. Well, let's start by asking, what are you going to do on Thursday on this issue? On Thursday, you are going to ask the speaker to allow us to ask questions to the president on uh, when is he going to pay back the money that uh, the remedial actions of the public protector said should be paid. Uh, and that is within our right. Uh, I heard people saying that the rules do not allow us to ask questions and to ask for point of privileges and order in terms of what happens. I've got the rule books of parliament here, both the joint rules of parliament and the National Assembly uh, rules. Uh, in terms of the National Assembly rules, the president was supposed to appear in parliament three times last year, in the last year, because we had three terms post the 2014 general elections. He only appeared for half a day. And uh, in terms of the parliamentary rules, he was supposed to come and complete that question session and still appear on the other 
Well, tabs there are those because who say the rules he didn't come because of you. No, but it doesn't work like that. Uh, there is no justification that is given like that. Also, there has never been air communication from the president that says that he is not coming because he is scared of the EFF. Uh, we thought he is not nervous. He says there's never been nervous in his life. How can he be scared of the EFF and not come to parliament to be accountable, uh, even when the rules clearly state that he must come and be accountable in parliament? I, well, I think it's, 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 it's a really lame excuse uh, for a president who, who goes around saying he's never been nervous in his life to be scared to be accountable to the economic freedom fighters and all members of parliament in, in, in parliament. Uh, he should have done so, and we, we're not going to let that go. We want him to answer questions now, as prescribed by the constitutions and the rules of the National Assembly and uh, what we have to deal with. Well, I did speak to the um, chief whip of the majority party earlier today. Um, and he says, uh, I mean, it's premature of you to demand what you are demanding because there are state age agencies um, that are looking into the portion um, of the money that the president is supposed to pay. And until that exercise is complete, uh, um, it, it um, Stone never, Caesar, and he says it is pointless. It, can, you never, it, can, never, it can never take can never take more than 12 months to determine how much you must pay. By the way, the SIE report uh, in Tunkanda has illustrated the non-security expenditures that were done on the construction of Nkanda. So the Minister of Police just has to take the report and calculate that uh, the swimming pool costed this much, the crawl costed this much, the theater costed this much, and these were non-security upgrades as per what was required. And then he says to the president that the non-security upgrades into your residence is this much. And not to hold parliament at ransom, and not to hold our institutions at ransom, because if there is no commitment, that the president is going to pay back the man. We're going to have a serious problem. We can't go ahead. The person is promising so many things, which he knows is never going to deliver, and he has not yet been held accountable on an area which the public protector has spoken. South Africa's democracy was designed in such a way that we must hold each other accountable through institutions, through parliament. That is why power is separated. Not one person rule who disrupts the institutions of democracy, who disrupts the, corrupting, the, corrupt, the corruption fighting institutions and, and harasses everyone and no one seems to be doing anything about it. We're not going to be part of the choir that is defending Jacob Zuma and parliament. We're not going to hold him accountable and make sure that he pays back that money. Mr. Stenazen, what's your position on this matter? Well, we certainly believe that the president does need to be held accountable, and both the president and the speaker need to give parliament an answer as to why the president missed those deadlines. Our view, however, is that disrupting the zone is not going to take the matter forward. What we need is a functioning parliament. There's only one party in South Africa who's going to benefit from a parliament that's dysfunctional, and that's the African National Congress. They've been trying for the last 15 years to break parliament. We're not in the business of giving the African National Congress what they want. So certainly if there are rules that are broken on the day, we will stand up and take uh, points of order if that, if that is what is required. But we want to hear what the president has to say. He's got a lot to answer for, and we will come hard next week after him on behalf of the South African people and raise during the debate on the state of the nation the issues that matter most to South Africans. Jobs, education, unemployment and crime. These are the key areas which he needs to set out his plan for. We then get an opportunity to have our say the following week. In addition to that, we believe that the president and the speaker have a perfect opportunity to diffuse this entire standoff uh, in Parliament. And that's by simply providing us five dates in the coming year where the president will appear in Parliament to fulfill his constitutional obligation. This will then uh, placate the South Africans and Parliament. We will then know that the president is coming to fulfill his obligations, and we will then be able to hold him to those dates. In the absence of them, uh, we simply don't know whether he will come or not. And that is problematic, and that is what's leading to this problem that we have in Parliament. So both the Speaker and the President have a golden opportunity to diffuse this entire situation and ensure that it goes off without a hitch on Thursday. Um, and so that's what we're looking forward to, and we hope that the Speaker is going to provide those dates to us uh, before the State of the Nation commences. Okay, Mr. Shurambu, um, does this issue have to... 
um, be a make or break situation. In other words, can you not uh, do what Mr. Sien Hazen seem to be, seems to be suggesting, and that is that there will be an opportunity a week later to deal with this issue and uh, um, other issues, but allow the state of the nation this week these to are, go ahead without any These glitches. are separate issues. The debate of the state of nation address is separate from the question session. In the state of nation address, we debate what is our input to the state of nation, what we think should be the priorities of the country. But we must ask specific questions to the president in terms of their own program of action. And the parliament rules provide for that. So you must not confuse this. That is why parliament rules say that the president must at least appear once in a term to answer questions in parliament. So the 11th of March is a separate, it's a normal thing. Last year he did not come on two occasions, and then the day he came there, the, the, the parliament uh, uh, question session was interrupted and disrupted by the speaker who dissolved the house and called police and did all sorts of dramatic things. They, so the question session and the debate are two separate things. We're going to debate the state of nation that there is no problem, but we want an opportunity to ask questions. We're still on question number one. We, 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 one question number one is the AFF on when is he going to pay back the money? We want to know as well as to, is he truly recipient of the money which people who brought money to Lanzera Airport, uh, the 10 million US dollars, was it given to him because there's very strong evidence that that money was meant for him. You, mu you must answer to that. You yeah. must answer as to the question of where are kids going to study once they finish metric because there's no universities, there's no uh, uh, FET colleges that can take all those students. You must answer to the question of what is going to happen to the pool of Malamlele. They've been demanding a municipality. There are no services. Even government demarcation report agrees that the poverty levels are too much there. There's, there's nothing to could show economically. You must still answer those questions. No. And when are we going to get an opportunity to deal with those things? In the state of national address, we're dealing with some either political and, and ideological issues. But he must have the question session as is demanded by the rules of the National Assembly and he must appear to answer questions there. So for you it's non-negotiable? Yes. Going forward, how do we ensure, uh, this is to both of you, how do we ensure that uh, in 2015 and beyond we get the kind of parliament that many South Africans aspire to and it is a parliament that takes into account accountability and all the other del service delivery and all the issues that both of you have raised but also equally the kind of parliament that is dignified, the kind of parliament that uh, every, each and every South Africans would be uh, proud of. I'll start with you, Mr. Stenison. Yeah, well, I think it's very important to note that for any parliament to function, wherever it is in the world, in fact, for any environment to function, there are rules, and we must respect the rules. You don't enforce rules by breaking rules. And so if we want to say that we're a party of the rules, then we must all agree to be barred by the rules of parliament okay. to ensure that the context of the debate that takes place is within the bill. And that, that is there to defend all parties in the House, including minority parties. If we end up with a situation where parties get up and shout and scream every time somebody gets up to speak from an opposing party, none of us would ever have an opportunity to be heard. And there'll be a race for the bottom of who can out scream who. So what we need is, is the rules to be applied. And when I say the rules to be applied, they must be applied equally to the president and the executive as they are applied to the members. It's not good enough for the Speaker of the National Assembly to send members of parliament to the Powers and Privileges Committee and institute disciplinary hearings and suspensions on members of parliament. But yet when the president breaks the rules of parliament himself, he's simply allowed to walk away scot-free. And you. so there has to be consequences. And so unless we have these rules and consequences, Consequences, and there are rules and consequences to which everybody that's in the National Assembly agrees to be bound, we're not going to see an end to the impasse. Okay, uh, we also need to ensure that those no. rules and, uh, and viewpoints and, uh. and uh, consequences are applied equally. And the Speaker has a very big role to play there because she is essentially the referee in Parliament. If she's a referee and wearing that African National Congress jersey, it's unlikely we're going to get a fair hearing. Thank so you. It's essential that we have an impasse partial speaker and the rules fairly and evenly applied to all. Thank you, Mr. Shwamu. Now look, the most important thing is that the ANC, particularly Gwede Mantashi, must understand that Parliament is not a branch of the ANC, where it gives instructions on what should happen and everything else. 
in most instances the parliament program was disrupted because where the Mantashe gave instructions of what should happen in parliament. Members were called from the oversight visits, from parliamentary work, which is very important, overseeing the institutions which are supposed to oversee in terms of the law. They were all called man of parliament wasted because Gwede was insisting that parliament must sit to suspend members of the EFF. On many occasions, the committees of parliament have been told to do illegal things. Even when there was no case against members of the EFF, Gwede says, no, go ahead and suspend them, give them the maximum sentence. They have to be humiliated by a court of law to say that that is not how parliament is run. Your own rules must be applied consistently and in accordance to natural justice and all these other things. If the ANC doesn't appreciate that that is not a branch of the ANC, it is a democratic institution of all members and that we are not, member, we are not, we are not members, we are not employees of the ANC in that parliament. We are democratically elected, we must be given a fair chance and space to engage on what we stand for and what we have been voted for in that parliament. They are not going to have peace. But if they continue to manage it as an ANC meeting, they will get what they need there. We are not going to be alleged to a wrongful decisions and instructions of presiding officers. If a presiding officer wrongfully tells us to leave parliament, we're not going to leave. If a presiding officer tells us to do whatever is illegal, we're not going to comply to illegal instructions from presiding officers. And that is, can only come when the ANC appreciates that that is not their branch. It's a democratic institution of South Africa that represents all South Africans and who must be given a fair chance, all of us, to speak uh, openly there. Thank you very much. Thanks to both of you, gentlemen, Mr. Senaizen and Mr. Shibambu, chief whips of the two um, leading uh, two opposition parties in parliament. Thanks to both of you. And now for the last word. President Jacob Zuma has described calls for him to repay money spent on his Nganda residence as a political ploy. He denied liability once again for the funds spent on uh, that he was guilty of its misuse. The president met editors yesterday at the presidential guest house in Pretoria. Why should it be an issue? Why should I pay back the money? When the very institutions that investigate say some other institutions must, must have a last word on that matter. Why must I pay it because EFF is saying so before, before that matter is concluded? And that is the last one. Which brings us to the end of uh, tonight's show. Do join me again, same time, tomorrow evening, as we build up to Thursday's much-awaited State of the Nation address. Uh, tomorrow we'll be speaking energy, we'll also be speaking mining, but we'll also be talking about the state of readiness from uh, uh, views from Parliament's presiding officers, but also from some of the people who do behind-the-scenes work helping the presiding officers in ensuring that everything goes according to the law, everything goes according to the rules of Parliament, and more importantly, everything uh, goes according to the South African in constitution, that supreme law of our land. So do join me again tomorrow for more interviews, views, and analysis. Thanks for joining us. It's a good night for today. <laughs>